I am at the airport. Gonna take a flight to Gijón, North Spain. Asturias, that's me. I will explain a little bit about this trip. I'm gonna meet a really cool artist, but first I need a coffee. Let's go and grab a coffee. Mo. Um, where do I even start? A month ago, I was doing research for my PhD. I came across a site called uh, videoactivism.net and I saw there is a uh, artist on the site as one of this, you know, resources for the reading link. And his name is Oliver Ressler and he's basically an uh, Austrian-based environmental activist artist. And I reached out to him and I was like, you know, do you want to do a video interview with me? And this month our subject is artivism. And he was like, oh, you're based in Spain. I'm going to visit Spain for uh, my solo show. It's going to open uh, on the 27th of January. I was like, oh, cool. So today I'm making my way to Gijón to the culture center called Laboral. It's probably the largest culture center in northern Spain to visit his solo show. I hope he's all right with the fact that I'm taking a flight to see, I mean, his show. I'll tell you the name is called Barricading the Ice Sheets, Reprocesses the Plant and the Planet. <laughs> At least I'm bringing my reusable coffee cups. Well, that's the least I can do. Oh, oh I think it's um, boarding now. I might go to the gate. We are here. Just uh, 45 minutes more on the bus. Oh, it's raining. Oh, finally. It took me 40 minutes wait and 50 minutes travel. I hope it finally offsets my emission for taking the flight. Let's go to the hotel. Wait, what is that? Arte activismo por el clima. Oh, I just got to the hotel. I mean, I'm not complaining, but let me tell you, to be environmentally aware is not easy. I was gonna take a taxi, which cost maybe 30 bucks. In 30 minutes, I would be in my hotel. But to offset my carbon emission, I decided to take the public transport. Finally, it took me two hours and I'm totally exhausted. And tomorrow I will be visiting Laboral to see uh, the exhibition barricading the ice sheets. I just wanna barricade the bed sheets, to be honest, right now. I have been environmentally aware, but I didn't realize how much work it takes to be fully aware and in a way it is a bit uh, counterproductive because you know I could have you know paid a taxi and come here quicker save my time to have more energy in some ways if you want to get to where you want to go maybe it's a place to be it's a project it's a milestone at work you can't just be very environmental friendly. Like the uh, billboard you have just seen, the light box, so it's illuminating, it's costing energy, but it's for the greater good. So am I gonna do the necessary evil? You know, sometimes I just have this soul searching uh, kind of moments. I just wanna record it before going to bed. Good morning. Ah, the sun is coming through the clouds. Today is going to be a beautiful day. Let's put on the shoes and go to the art exhibition. But before going, I just want to mention a very quick small thing is that I am not paid to say anything or to show you anything in any of my videos. I cover art events on my own for my channel, for my audience. That is your guys. Well, I do get paid from our patrons. So here I want to give a big shout out to our lovely patrons that you see on the screen. Thank you very much for your support and now let's go to see the art exhibition we are here laboral they are just there the press conference just ended and now they are making the tour so we can maybe start from the beginning, like the like the press tour, and we just quickly walk walk through. My name is Oliver Ressler. I'm an artist and filmmaker. We are here in Gijón, in the Laboral, and this is a large solo exhibition uh, with on 1,200 square meters with 50 works. And the title is Barricading the Ice Sheet, Reprocess the Plant, the Planet. 
it deals primarily on climate breakdown, the climate justice movements, and to some as aspect also how they relate, how they connect to the art. So let's start. When we enter the space, we uh, have here a huge wall with photographic works. The majority of my work is quite uh, video based. Therefore, it's important, I think, also to have photographic work that uh, within one or two minutes give you a possibility to get some access uh, to the themes of the work. And then when you are maybe more interested, then you take your time to check out the films which often last 25 minutes, half an hour, or maybe even 40 minutes. Here we see a film that was recorded in Vienna. During the pandemic, there was a blockade of a construction site for a new city highway. And I spent several uh, months there, every month doing one conversation. Yeah, put all the material together in a film, which is a quite new film. Here, this is a major work. Property will cost us the earth is a quote from a book by Andreas Malm titled How to Blow Up a Pipeline. Uh, in which he argues that the, all the means of production are in the hands of a huge transnational corporation makes it so complicated to go in the direction of decarbonization uh, and an ecologization of the uh, economy. And when we come closer, we see that all these letters uh, consist of uh, ink drawings of animals close to extinction. So all the animals are on a list of endangered species. And in this text, there are 400 species uh, close to extinction. There are calculations by different uh, scientists that uh, on a daily basis, 150 to 200 species are getting extinct. And therefore, uh, some scientists also talk about that we are living in the sixth mass extinction event. And this uh, work is uh, referring uh, to it. Uh, who did the drawings? The drawings are being done by Claudia Schioppa, an Italian artist uh, who collaborated with me on this piece and did a really amazing work. A polar bear is, of course, also an animal that's on the list uh, of endangered species. Just uh, they live in the Arctic and in the Arctic all the ice is melting. It's uh, quite a shame to see that their, the ecological field is uh, collapsing and uh, also to see the negative effects on certain species. The flag is uh, uh, titled oil spill flag. It's a Norwegian flag. And this was uh, quite a scandal when I showed this flag uh, in Tromsø, in the north of Norway in 2019. Norwegian is one of the largest petroleum producers in the world per capita. And so it's a merging between an oil spill and the Norwegian flag, pointing also to this responsibility. Also, a petroleum producing uh, nation has uh, in relation to the rise of the temperature. And what's your nationality? I'm Austrian. Did you criticize your own country? I'm criticizing my own country uh, continuously, but not in relation to petroleum production, just because there is no petroleum uh, production in Austria. I was talking about this uh, occupation of this uh, street uh, and in, in Vienna, and I was one of the 50 guys uh, who got a letter of uh, intimidation. There was a risk that each of us would need to pay for the loss of this, the city, that the street could not be built as it was originally planned. So it was delayed for several months because it was occupied. And I was one of the people who got such a, a letter. 
So you see that also locally when you involve yourself uh, in certain uh, movements, there's always a risk uh, to be criminalized also as an artist. This is, I think, a quite uh, exceptional work, the film behind me. It was recorded uh, 60 kilometers north of Bergen uh, in the uh, technology center Monkstad. And that's the largest facility on the globe uh, invested in carbon capture and storage. This is this technology the petroleum corporations try to push our corporations to fund as a climate technology because in the refinery process of the petroleum they try to uh, absorb the carbon emissions. But of course uh, this is a technology which would continue our dependency from petroleum. Instead of leaving it in the ground, the uh, corporations have an interest in continue extracting it just because it's so profitable for them. Closely connected to it is also this tripod. A tripod is uh, usually used in forms of mass civil disobedience. Usually there's a platform on it and one or two people are sitting or lying on the platform and it's usually so high that the police cannot reach the platform and they need a crane in order to, to get the activists from the platform. So it's used often to block streets or the entrance of a climate destructive facility. Here, this is a very particular uh, tripod. If you see here, uh, it's uh, drill bits. These are drill bits that are being used in the petroleum industry. So my opinion is that we should leave petroleum in the ground. Leave it in the ground is also one of the central demands of the climate justice uh, movements. This barricading the ice sheets is a cycle of uh, solo exhibitions and this is already the fifth uh, iteration of it. And in difference to all the others, I included this cycle of four works titled Occupy, Resist, Produce and it focuses on work-controlled factories. Workers that are managed to take over their factories and continue producing goods in a democratic manner where all the decisions are being made in assemblies and the former bosses, the former owners got kicked out. Once workers get the possibility to take over their own workplaces, usually these workplaces, they are going green, they are going into organic production. And therefore, I think if we talk about an ecologization, about the uh, production and the decarbonization of the production, it's of a huge help and it makes lots of things easier when it's uh, uh, in the hands of workers and not of huge corporations for getting as much profit out of uh, the operations as uh, possible. So this is maybe one of the hearts of the exhibition as this is a space where we see seven films focusing on forms of mass civil disobedience by our movements. So it brings together all six films of the cycle. Everything's coming together while everything's falling apart, each of them focusing on one event of mass civil disobedience. Like here, this is an action uh, a blockade of the red carpet of the Venice Film Festival in uh, September 2019, where uh, yeah, a lot of attention for climate uprising could also be uh, transmitted uh, to the media because all the press was already there to, uh, to record the, the stars walking the red carpet in the late afternoon. And if we turn 180 degrees, now behind me is one video uh, titled Not Thinking Swarming, which points towards how these acts of mass civil disobedience 
are being organized, where we can follow a four hour long uh, discussion of different delegates of different uh, groups in Madrid who uh, organized the blockade of uh, a city highway close to the Ministry of Environmental Affairs. Yeah, we can move to the Arctic movie now. In the last year, I uh, participated in a scientific expedition. It focused primarily on climate breakdown, so 90 scientists participated in that. The Arctic, uh, obviously, uh, for decades and for centuries, was covered by snow. There is this Arctic uh, summer sea ice. In the past 30, 40 years, that was uh, decreasing a lot because um, the white of the snow usually reflects like 99% uh, of the incoming energy back to the, to the space. And if the white, the snow and the ice is not there anymore and we have dark sea or dark rocks, then uh, half of the energy stays there locally and it increased locally a lot of temperature. There's not enough attention in the media uh, about that and so therefore I tried to produce this uh, film in order to address this issue from my point of view. First thing, I took a flight here, I hope you don't mind. I mean, it's not the most environmental friendly thing. I think we all have to change our way how we live and move and work and heat and what we eat. I also took a flight to come here, coming from Vienna. It would have been quite complicated otherwise. We really have to fight for um, better train systems, that trains also are much better connected internationally. There's an initiative uh, called Back on Tracks. They really work on bringing uh, the train connections internationally uh, into a better flow. At the moment, uh, there are other things that would be more on the top of my priority list, right? I mean, due to the um, war of Russia against Ukraine, all across uh, Europe, we see the fossil industries uh, uh, emerging. Uh, so uh, Germany just uh, extended uh, the possibility for corporations to dig even more coal for now. Uh, in Austria, where I come from, they were discussing uh, opening a coal-fired power plant again. So we see a huge backlash at the moment. And I think the main priority has to be to stop this new climate destructive industry, uh, climate destructive facilities to be built because then they will lock in the next 30, 40, 50 years that we also use this infrastructure that's being built. If you can change one law in your country, what would it be? I think the things are not so easy because um, the thing with the global warming uh, we are facing does not require the change of one law, it requires the change of hundreds of laws. We're living in a multi-dimensional uh, crisis. Uh, there's not only climate crisis but also uh, our democratic systems are, uh, uh, are in, in a crisis. We are living in a mass extinction crisis. Our social systems, our educational systems are in crisis. And we have to fix all these things at the same time. You have to bring all different uh, branches together just in order to find solutions. The solutions are actually on the table. It's not that much you have to invent. Uh, it's just that you have to uh, carry out uh, these things against existing power relationships and against uh, existing uh, forms of how capital is being accumulated. And that's the problem, right? Does art offer solutions? And the artist would say, we can't solve those problems. 
this is a question which which would maybe be uh, enough for an anthology of books or an entire cycle of conferences. But uh, l let me point towards a few central uh, arguments. So one is that I think that the emergence of the climate crisis goes hand in hand with the emergence of neoliberal capitalism. So in the past 30 years, uh, as much petroleum has been extracted and burned as in the entire history of mankind combined. So we cannot disconnect the climate crisis from a uh, political and economic crisis linked to the system in which, it, which we live and which causes these carbon emissions. So therefore, I think uh, we have to fight for a way that uh, does not put profits anymore into the center of any economic activity. But uh, I think there must be different things that are being put into the center. Uh, decarbonizing uh, social rights, uh, the, the democratic right to people to participate, uh, decision-making uh, processes. And I think to achieve this, uh, it's very complicated to do it within an existing system. So you need to have a larger project of a uh, systemic transition in order to get a system in place that takes these things into consideration. Yeah, what's the function? What can be the function of art and art production in this process? Um, I think it can be a multiplicity of different functions that art uh, can have in this. On the one hand, what you can see here in this exhibition that I document a lot of these uh, uh, acts of uh, mass civil disobedience. Uh, I think this is a very important function, but I would never limit it towards uh, documenting and, and filming because there are many possibilities of artists how to involve in the movements. There is, for example, this group called Tools for Action and they produce these great silver inflatables. You can see them in two of my films in the backgrounds. In the case of police violence, these are often being used to put between an attacking police and uh, the activists. So it's a kind of a physical barrier. So would you like to call yourself an activist first before being an artist? So I think in my uh, artistic work, these identities of an artist, a filmmaker, and an activist, they kind of merge. So I come from an art background. <clears throat> I have a formal art education in an art uh, university that I finished with a degree. Uh, but already while I was uh, studying, I was trying to merge my artistic work with my uh, political uh, wishes and my political interests. What advice would you give to an artist who, who wants to enter this world of artivism like you did, but maybe because his profile is not an art profile, maybe because the ideas are too radical, he can't get public funding, he can't get the grants. What advice would you give to this person? Um, I, I started to get my first uh, recognition in public funds 25 years ago and things changed a lot. Uh, there were not even social media at that time, right? There was not really internet, so we were communicating with fax machines. Um, in my personal understanding, I think it's very important to establish a certain network, a certain network of other artists whom you trust and who share your interests. So if you are an artist who uh, wants to do work 
on and connected to activism, then I think you need a network of other artists who have a comparable interest and of activists who are willing to collaborate with you. And uh, this is one of the most important things. I, I think that social media, that they can be quite helpful, I think, to generate some visibility. It's also very important to know what other artists did in, in that field on, in which you focus, so maybe art and activism, and uh, the exhibitions that exist in this field and the curators and the art institutions that are active in this field. Because this is the main network where you are working. And sooner or later you will need to personally connect to these main actors. It's probably not uh, sufficient to tag uh, a curator in a social media posting but you will probably uh, need to meet him during a conference uh, to establish personal connections to get things running. Yeah, if you're not blind, you can see the war is ahead and we are speeding full speed, crushing the war. I mean, this is clear. In my childhood, there's a paper factory across the river and they would dump this water into the river and I would have like skin rashes all over and we would visit emergency room and there were like long queues of people who have same symptoms and they even developed a herbal remedy for people. I mean, it's, it's clear. How do you fight the, the sentiments of, let's say, sometimes I feel like there's no point because it's clear that it's, we are doomed, right? So how do you fight this? I mean, do you get this sensation sometimes and how do you keep motivating yourself? I think there is no possibility to give up, right? I mean, I'm, I agree to some extent that uh, we are really uh, running at full speed in the wrong direction, in the direction of doom. But at the same time, um, there's still a possibility maybe to slow down the train and uh, there will be a crash, but maybe more people will survive. It's just a necessity uh, to continue the struggle and not give up. And the continuation of the struggle uh, in relation to climate breakdown will also be the difference between uh, life and death of hundreds of millions of people on the planet, right? Here in Europe, we are in a privileged situation uh, because uh, it's like a uh, first-class uh, train uh, that will be less affected of the crash and uh, you will survive a few years and maybe even a few decades longer. But uh, the, the crash is almost unavoidable, right? Still, I think uh, every uh, per percentage of one degree we manage not to increase uh, is something that, that makes the difference for humans to live or die or for, for other life uh, beyond humans to, to live or die and not to become extinct. So therefore, I think uh, we need to continue fighting. And I think art can have a specific function in this fight. In a bit, there will be an inauguration and I'm just waiting for it to open. You can see there's a comfortable chair. You can you know, watch uh, the building of where you are right now from the virtual reality using this Oculus. Uh, but it's locked, so you know, your view to the reality is restricted. Besides wrestlers exhibition, there's another one here is an immersive installation about a forest. Let's go and check it out. Um, this is the exhibition. I was told that I can take one of those little green riding hood and go into the exhibition hall. <laughs> it's really weird.
Chan. Oh my god, I can't believe the artist talked for like an hour and a half non-stop and now it's like 9 o'clock, 9 o'clock and they're still there uh, <laughs> the drinks haven't even started I don't know, I feel like sleeping I want to go to bed oh, Let's go to bed Good morning! Yesterday I came back to the hotel so tired and I fell asleep right away. Usually you go to an art inauguration, you talk with artists, uh, sipping on some wine or water, and you know, just talking about the weather and then, you know, it's over. But no, yesterday it was a two hour conference talk by the artist about climate change. And then one hour visiting the exhibition with uh, you know, the audience and they were talking about very serious climate issues, you know, not like those talking about the weather. I mean, yes, it is about weather in a way, but not like, you know, talk about the weather. And I met some people from the audience um, called uh, Extinction Rebellion, uh, this group, and they were doing really interesting things and they were talking with the artists about massive civil disobedience. And the artist was like, yeah, this and that. And I was like, what? <laughs> so people knew right away I wasn't an activist, I wasn't an artivist. So um, I think the first thing I learned from this whole day, like I learned many interesting things, but the first thing first is that you cannot really fake it until you make it when it comes to uh, being an activist. Don't try to pretend to be an artivist if you want attention, if you want to get into it. Just be honest about it. If you don't know, you don't know, right? And they're super nice people, so they will like um, take your hand and walk you through the process and teach you about certain issues so you are better informed. And then later on, you can qualify because those people who will be visiting your exhibitions will likely uh, be much more hardcore than yourself, much more informed and educated about these issues. So don't pretend in front of them. That's like my first uh, kind of thoughts when it comes to after spending this day at this exhibition. And the second thing is, um, I pick up the press release and I see that uh, uh, it's in Spanish. They say uh, Laboral uh, hosts the largest exhibition in Spain about climate change and uh, action of the citizens. And that, the first line, the title, um, did not contain the word art. So I was like, maybe it's a language thing, right? Exhibition is already like art exhibition per se. But um, I realized another thing is that when you are an artivist, likely your art is taking a back seat. Um, you have to be okay with it. It's not that um, the art is not important. No, your visual expression is, of course, super important, and that defines your art, the whole exhibition. You know, it, people come to see things. If they don't see anything, of course, you know, the art is, is there. But when people communicate and talk about you and your art, likely the message comes before and your art is taking a back seat in a way is good because the whole point is to get the message through so if the message is there before and louder and more obvious than anything else you have succeeded but for some artists this is also quite painful because they look at you as an activist not as an artist and maybe that's not something you're comfortable about but this seems to be for now what i can see is uh, a common kind of uh, uh, practice when people look at you they say you are an uh, activist first and you know and they they don't think there's anything wrong with it i mean i don't think there's anything wrong as long as you're happy but you might think this is something wrong and the last thing just promise you this is the last thing i say and i will let you go about your day I came to a second exhibition at the same location, so I walked downstairs and there was this immersive exhibition called The World is Forest. No, it's not a grammatical mistake, it's called The World is Forest. And it's beautiful, so I put on the little green hoodie, I walked through the exhibition, and I realized that it's also about environmental awareness about restoring nature on this planet so it's not necessarily political you don't have to make a political message 
to transmit your message about environment. So I don't know really how to put it. Basically, you don't have to be an activist to tell certain things about what you want to say. Like, let's restore the nature. Yeah, um, you don't need necessarily to shout it out loud like an activist. You can do it in a very soft and poetic way. And it's okay because people get this message as well. It might take longer. It might take certain kind of uh, sensitive people to understand what you're trying to say. But eventually, people will understand it. It's almost like winking at someone. You're like, what is she trying to do? And you wink, you wink. <laughs> but you can just say it out loud, but you can also wink to someone to get their attention and get this message across. So being an activist, being an artist is not the only way to get your message across. If you want to become one, there are good things and there are bad things that comes with it in a package. If you don't want to become one, just make your art, transmit the message and do it like you always do. And that's also okay. So <laughs> it's 12 o'clock. I need to check out of the hotel. Oops, two minutes to 12. I need to pack and check out and uh, maybe walk around the city a little bit and take the train back to Madrid. So that's all for today. Thank you for watching. See you.